but also for us. It will be credited to us all the ones believing in Him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. You know, in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, when you came in and you identified with the offering, the sin offering, that was for unintentional sins. What about the intentional sins? No. -uh. But I want you to look at what he says here in verse 25. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. What's a trespass? Well, we're going to see in chapter 5 that the law came alongside the sons of Adam. Why? To stir them up to break the law. A trespass is a sign that says no trespassing. It codifies what we know. You know, you could go in somebody's yard and if there's no sign there, you may or may not, I mean, you kind of know you're not supposed to be there, but it's not strictly prohibited. And there's a line there, but we don't know whether we crossed it or not. But when he says no trespassing, we know we could cross the line. And he says he was delivered up for our knowingly cross the line. Our intentional sins and raised for our justification. How many of us have willfully sinned in our life? All of us that have any age to speak of, we come in the world as sinners. And when we start reading the law, it stirs us up to do sin. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, let's say Mama baked a batch of cookies and she's got them in the kitchen and you come in the door and she says, stay out of my cookies. What do you do? You say, cookies, cookies. I'm going to go get me a cookie if I can slip one. That's what the law does. We had not thought about a sin until it stirred our passions up to do it. I want to say a little bit about the fifth chapter of Romans. The fifth chapter of Romans, I know the eighth chapter is the crown jewel, but the most important chapter in Romans is chapter 5. If you can get chapter 5, the rest of Romans, in fact, the rest of your theology will be so easy to grasp. I remember when I was not long after high school, I can't tell you I was... 18 or 19 or 20, but somewhere I read in there, my mentor, my first mentor, Jesse Kennan, taught us at Ridgecrest Baptist Church federal headship. We're going to study that in depth in this chapter, and it's verses 12 through 19, and the part about the law comes in at 20. But if you can get a grasp on the federal headship of Christ. You will open your mind to understanding almost all theology. Did you know that almost every era in the church comes from a failure to understand the fifth chapter of the book of Romans? So I implore you, open your ears, open your eyes to God as He speaks. This is God speaking. This is not my speaking. This is God speaking. Now, as we look at this, we're, we see in chapter 5, verse 1, we are declared righteous. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean it makes us righteous. It means it declares us righteous. In fact, you could go to a court and be guilty and because there's not enough evidence to convict you, you could be declared righteous even though you're guilty. And we know, all know of people that have gotten off that we knew were guilty. I'm not going to name any names. I mean, I could be named one of them. There's, there are things I've done I got away with because nobody saw it or nobody had enough evidence. I got away. 
So I was, quote, declared righteous even though I hadn't been to a court of law. But one day, God grabbed me about that. He showed me just how wicked I was. And He called me as His own and declared me righteous. So it means declared righteous, not make righteous. It doesn't change who you are. It changes the way God regards you in me when He declares us righteous because He treats us as righteous. How can He do that? Isn't it true that in the book of um, Proverbs, don't you listen to this? Proverbs 17, verse 15, acquitting the guilty and condemning the just, both are detestable to the Lord. Isn't that what God did to us? He acquitted us. We were guilty. And He condemned the just. How did He do that? He condemned His only Son, Jesus Christ, the unique Son, the God-man, the second person of the Trinity, the seed of Abraham and hung him on a tree making him a curse for us who were cursed. That's who Jesus is. That's how he did it. And in fact, in verse, listen to this. Chapter 24. Verse, four, verse 24. 24-24. Whoever says to the guilty, you're innocent, isn't that why God said we're innocent? People will curse him and nations will denounce him, but it will go well with those who convict the guilty. Who is the most hated person in the world? Jesus. His followers catch some fallout. It's nothing like what he put up with for us. And so here we are in Romans, and he says he declares us righteous through faith in Christ. It's not just through faith. It's through faith in Christ. We trust Christ for what He did. His incarnation. His living a perfect life for us. He is becoming the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice because He had lived a perfect life which we had not. And He was able to go on the altar before God and become the propitiation where God poured out His wrath on Him for all the ones believing the ones that God would call. And it says, this, this, listen, listen to this. We also rejoice in our afflictions. I'm sorry, wrong verse. We have obtained access through Him, through faith, into this grace in which we stand. We're saved by grace. The grace of God, and we stand in that grace. We stood in that grace the day we became in Christ, became a saint. We stand in that grace throughout our life. And one day at the end, when Christ comes again, we will be in that grace still. There's no one that has ever done anything that God owes him anything as far as righteousness. No one. Not even. No. So let's go and look at how this works out compared to the old because this is what Paul is doing in Romans he's comparing the old covenant and how they were saved or thought they were saved and come to find out they were saved the same way we are through the cross Romans 3.25 that God put Christ on a billboard as it were for the sins that were past what were those sins the Old Testament sins. And we see in Hebrews 11 the great hall of faith of the Old Testament. And they are not made perfect apart from us. We are one body. There's no Jewish church over here and a Gentile church over here. No, there's one new person because we're under a new covenant. And all the ones that believe and trust and rely on the apostles' teachings are under the new covenant with the other saints. And they're cheering us on. It says, oh, in 12, 1, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And they are 
watching us run the race. But we're going to look a little bit at chapter 9. Looking at verse 11 and reading to the end. We're not going to exposit every verse, but we're going to look at some. And um, we may revisit this before it's done with. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of bulls and calves, but by His own blood having obtained eternal redemption. What? Eternal redemption? Redemption for all time? From time and eternity? Yes, if you're a saint in Christ, you have been eternally redeemed. You cannot be lost. Now we are told to make our calling and election sure. But we don't add anything to what Christ has done for us. And it says right here, eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young heifer sprinkling those who are defiled sanctified for the purification of the flesh how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse our consciences from dead works so that we can serve the living God through the, the eternal father put Christ on a billboard who through the eternal spirit the eternal Son offered Himself as a sacrifice for all the ones believing. How much more is this than some goat or cat? Is what He's saying. Because they could not cleanse the conscience. That was the problem in the Old Covenant. Every year the priest would walk in there and there's that altar and he would offer a sacrifice and there was a previous year's blood and the previous year's blood, and the previous year's blood, knowing it wasn't efficacious. But he was looking forward to the Lamb of God. It could not cleanse the conscience. But Christ, look, look, every year they had to do that on the Day of Atonement. And they all had other sacrifices too, but that was the sacrifice each year. Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance. Eternal redemption. Eternal inheritance. Eternal God. We're one in Christ. We're united with the eternal Christ. Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant. We're in a new covenant. We're not under the bulls and calves. We're under the blood of Christ. Where a will exists, the death of the one who made it must be established. Yes, in order for us to inherit that, Christ had to give His life. He had to pass on into death so that we could inherit. A will is valid only when people die. It is never in effect while the one who made it is living. So Christ dies, but He lives again. Revelation 1. Behold, I died, and I am alive forevermore, eternally. Yet I am alive. That is Jesus, our Savior. He is a Savior to the uttermost. He doesn't do partial salvations. That is why even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when every command had been proclaimed by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water, scarlet, wool, and this and sprinkle the scroll itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God has ordained for you. Well, this old covenant has passed. Jesus fulfilled it by dying and He's given us a new covenant. And He says, this, in the same way He sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship. Therefore, it was necessary because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness must be forgiven through the blood of Christ. It was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens, the copies are on the earth, the real is in heaven, where Christ did His work. It says, 
the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than bulls and goats and sheep. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself so that he might now appear in the presence of the Father for us. He did not do this to offer himself many times as the old high priest had every year, but once. He offered it once, once, once for all time. Never again will he offer himself as a sacrifice to sin. You can come knowing he has paid the price for anyone who will say, Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Otherwise, he would have to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he's appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he began a new age. The old covenant age is gone. The new messianic age is here. We live in the age of the Messiah. He is a king. Come to him. Psalm 2 says, God has set his king in Zion and the nations better pay homage to him or they will suffer the rejection of Christ eternally. Just as it is appointed for people to die once, if you live long enough and Christ doesn't come, you will die. I will die. Everyone will die. We may die before we're born, after we're born shortly, or we may live to be 100 years or 900 years, whatever our time span is. But it is appointed to us to die once. And after that comes judgment. We will be judged for every idle word, every idle thought in our mind. Everything that we said, everything that we did will be judged. There are two judgments, the cross and the throne. You want to be judged at the cross where Christ took all kinds of sin and paid the penalty for them? Or do you want to wait till the afterlife where you will stand before God and give an account for everything you have ever done? So, He's appointed to die once. And He's appointed then to be judged. And then it says, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, He came and bore all the sins of anyone who would believe in Him. All the ones believing have had their sins bared. Be one of those. Be the blessed man that God will never, ever charge with sin. Because the only way you can do this is to be in the blessed man, Christ. And after bearing the sins of many, he went back to heaven. He will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Are you eagerly awaiting the return of the Messiah? Hebrews 12 says, Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Now, <clears throat> receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do His will, working in us what is pleasing in His sight, not our sight, His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God richly bless all who listen to this, and bless you with conversion or strength in you. Amen. <coughs>